Um, so come to those and participate in the discussions. It will be very interactive. So some of the topics include um, learning and education, MOOCs uh, as one topic, another topic, uh, entrepreneurship um, and histories of organizational culture and how it plays out in contemporary entrepreneurship culture, um, and research through design. So these are some of the three upcoming panels of the next week, so watch out for those. Okay, um, Sophia, I'll just briefly introduce her. So she, Sophia is actually new to campus. She started out in the fall um, with us here in, uh, over at Stamps. And um, before coming here, um, she was working in a variety of areas in and around interaction design and engineering, uh, bringing the perspective of an artist to creating new technologies in the service of mental and physical well-being, and I believe she will talk about this today. So Bruckner um, earned um, an MFA in Digital and Media at the Rhode Island School of Design, and there she explored um, simultaneously empowering and controlling aspects of technology, partic particularly within user experience design and computer programming, and again with a focus on artwork and art production. She was then a researcher at the MIT Media Lab in the Fluid Interfaces Group, where she combined the understanding that interfaces <coughs> structure thought processes with ideas from cognitive behavioral therapy to design and also focusing on building interactive devices for mental health. So um, throughout her work, you know, she's very driven to raise awareness on the technology's controlling aspects and is committed to encouraging the ethical and thoughtful um, design processes in and around technology. And she has taught a really exciting and special series of courses on the topic, uh, focusing on science fiction uh, and how science fiction can be applied to science fabrication. Um, and that course actually has received a lot of attention. Um, she's been teaching this since 2011. Um, was well received by the students, but also by media outlets, and in that sense has received international recognition even. Um, her work has also been exhibited internationally, including um, um, at places like SIGGRAPH, the Bemi Center for Contemporary Art, and the Leaders in Software and Art Conference in New York. And uh, Sophia was actually born in Detroit, so there was a lot also about this region here. Um, and a fun fact that I thought um, I want to lead in when you start the talk is um, she thinks of herself as a cyborg. I'll talk about um, that too. Feeling inseparable <laughs> from computers since the age of two. Welcome, Sophia. Thank you for that very nice intro. So I'm Sophia Bruckner, and I'm, I'm very grateful to be here and have this opportunity to share my work with you. I hope I don't uh, weird you out too much. Um, but you know, as I'm talking, feel free to if you want if you have a burning question you want to ask me, feel free to interrupt me at any time. Um, so Winston Churchill famously said that we shape our buildings, and thereafter they shape us. And then um, you guys might be familiar with Sherry Turkle, who's a researcher at MIT and the author of the book Alone Together. Um, she said that technology has become the architect of our intimacies. But I wouldn't, I, I don't really like that phrasing very much. Excuse me? Oh, is the microphone on? Is the microphone not on? Oh, okay, I keep going. So I, would, I don't really like that phrasing very much because it's um, putting too much in the technology. What actually is happening is people are building technology and then we're adapting ourselves to that technology. And um, you guys here are going to be those people in not too long, actually. So uh, people are increasingly aware that technology has a lot of harmful and controlling effects. Uh, for example, there's been a lot of press recently talking about how Facebook is making people less happy and so on. Uh, but I don't think we really understand uh, why, this, why this is happening and to what extent it's happening. And um, knowing that these forces are there, how are we going to make sure that new technology is being designed in an ethical way? And, you know, and finally, like knowing that these controlling forces are there whenever we do anything with um, interface, interface design and technology, how do we actually harness those forces to do something positive? So that is what uh, my research is about. Um, let's see. So, uh, okay, the, my weird background. So I, I would say, I don't know whether I should call myself a designer and engineer or an artist. Um, and uh, sometimes I say like, on a, on a bad day I call myself a weirdo. On like a neutral day I say I'm like a misfit. And like on a really grandiose day I say I'm a unicorn. So I don't know, today I'll say I'm a misfit. Um, but uh, I've been through like industry research and the fine arts, uh, but the underlying thread to the entire journey of my work has been this investigation of how technology, and in particular interface design, shapes the way we see ourselves, our relationships, and the world around us. So um, in my talk, I'm gonna, like, it's going to have kind of three sections to it. Uh, first, I want to give some background on how uh, my experience in industry has um, influenced what I do now. 
and then i want to talk a little bit about my work as an artist and how that you know caused me to see my relationship with technology in a new way and then finally um how those things led into my current research topic which is on loneliness and the design of social networks and connected technology and then finally i'm gonna ha i have to i have to talk about science fiction a little bit because it's my obsession so that's what i'm gonna end up um, so first a little bit of background about me um, so I, uh, so I actually have a pretty technical uh, background. I got my Bachelor of Science in Computer Science and Applied Mathematics from Brown University. Um, then for many years, I actually went to Silicon Valley and I was working full time as an engineer and a designer at Google and Microsoft. Uh, for most of the time, I worked on iGoogle. Did any of you guys ever use iGoogle? So I was, okay, good. <laughs> so I was one of the first, uh, for, it was a really small team when I joined. I was one of the first engineers at iGoogle. Um, and since then, um, it's been replaced by smartphones and mobile apps, uh, which makes total sense. But at the time, like when you were making an app, you were making an app for a platform like this. Uh, so um, iGoogle, uh, for those of you who don't know, would allow users to customize their Google search page with apps written by both Google and developers outside. Um, and uh, we, want, we at the time served about a quarter of Google search traffic. We had tens of millions of active users. And while I was there, I designed and wrote some of the most popular iGoogle apps in the world, um, many of which had several million users each. And I also traveled all over the world talking about Google, uh, the Google um, app API. So uh, this, I, I really liked this time of my career. Um, so I was much more practical then than I am now. Um, uh, so I, I, but I, what, what it taught me was that, uh, you know, making technology at the scale is really rewarding, but also very humbling. So when I made something that the users liked, I got like fan mail, like wonderful fan mail. It was so nice. People were so delighted. Uh, but then sometimes I would be asked to do something that I knew the users were going to hate. <laughs> and I would do it, and we would get like the, the kind of emails you would get were really, uh, there's like thousands, you get thousands of hate mails. And like the reaction was like so, um, they're angry, distrustful, and like it was like almost visceral. Like you could see the users felt like betrayed and even like, like violated when we would like ch make a change that they didn't approve of, uh, because they had a, they really invest a lot of themselves into like the products you're making. So I became really aware of how even small design choices had a huge impact on an incredibly large amount of people, uh, many of which were arranging their entire day around our product, which is like really humbling to think about. Uh, so in the early days of iGoogle, I actually worked on early social uh, social features before uh, before Facebook was really popular. And we created these kind of shared applications that were like shared bits of homepage um, real estate between people. It's kind of like keeping a channel open um, between the people you care about. And I thought the interactions that played out in this um, in this uh, design were really like beautiful, intimate, and playful. And it was like a very uplifting time in my career. However, at the same time, the Facebook was being Silicon Valley. Um, and so I thought the, like the tech culture changed a lot. Um, and so I felt like everything we started to do was a reaction to Facebook. And like the priorities of our product changed, and like design and product decisions became much more metrics driven and incremental, and like the emotions of people um, using our products were like less considered, especially not in any sort of holistic kind of way. So I, I really I stopped uh, enjoying what I was doing, and I realized instead of implementing all these things, I really want to be the person on the creative side who's deciding what we're going to make. So at that point, I decided to go back to grad school, and I went to RISD, which is something I had actually always wanted to do all my life, so it was the perfect time to do it. Um, so while I was at RISD, all my work was about technology. And I like to show this, I show my paintings because it's a good intro into my work. Um, I'm not primarily a painter, uh, but all my work was about technology and I've been doing technology forever. And so I was trying to like get, take a break from computers, but then I, so I was painting, but I turned out to not be so big a bunch of an escape from technology after all. So um, as an exercise, I decided to paint all of my computers I ever owned from memory. <laughs> And uh, so this is a painting of my Commodore 64, which was my first computer. And I think I got it when I was two, but maybe even one. I, can, I, I, it's, mi I it's mixed about that. But I cannot remember a time where I did not have a computer that I was, I was around all the time. Like, I interacted with computers much more than people. Anyway, I loved this computer, and like I was completely inseparable from computers ever since. Um, this was my Dell Dimension Pentium 2. It was one of my grade school computers. And again, um, this is a painting that I did from memory. So as I was painting these things, um, I started to some notice something like really funny about the way I was painting them, and I realized that they actually looked a lot like this. Um, I don't know if you guys recognize this. Maniac Vision. <laughs> Maniac Vision. <laughs> yes. So these are screenshots from like this, the very, very classic computer game from 
the 80s for DOS Maniac Mansion, which is a, pla is a classic adventure game, represents a lot of games at the time, and like now having gotten my first computer when I was two, um, I, I did spend quite a bit of time playing these games, a lot. Um, and so you can see how just uh, in my paintings, like this, there's like a strange use of perspective. Um, so there's kind of this like, it looks like a pre-Renaissance painting before there was point perspective. And there's this like unusual level of uh, detail to things like vents and um, windows and, and like uh, things like that. You can see I, I like did the same, I did the same thing. Um, and then uh, any landscape that was outside of a window was really abstracted because the pixels were huge. And so like I was actually doing the same thing. And this was all showing up in the way I was remembering the physical spaces around my computers. Um, and so like even as I started to remember like how physical spaces were arranged around, um, you know, in my memory, I started to realize I don't even have a sense of scale in my in my memory in, when I in that, when I think about these places. It feels much more like a computer data structure where I'm thinking of like nodes and links and things are connected to each other, but without like any sort of real sense of distance. Um, so this is where I get into my cyborg thing. I say we're all cyborgs, and like most people don't realize it. And like when I was making these paintings, I like saw clearly I was a cyborg. Like I couldn't, re I can't, like well, I couldn't, I still can't really disentangle who I am from the technology that shaped me as I was growing up. And so I had, uh, for my age, I had an unusually like strict, like immersive experience with computers. But now this is the case for everyone, um, except the the state of what computers are is different. And so what does that mean? Um, so the computer uh, the computer game obsession still exists. Um, so this, uh, so I'm still like using artwork to investigate my relationship with virtual space and physical space. Um, and I, I really like digital fabrication. So this is a screenshot from the 1991 DOS RPG computer game, Eye of the Beholder 2, Legend of Dark Moon. Um, it's a classic D&D RPG. I don't know if you guys play these, but it's the, it's yes. <laughs> All right, so there's one person here who understands me. <laughs> I, I can't be nerdier than you. You guys are in the school of information. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, these are those faux 3D games where it's like not really 3D. It's kind of faking a 3D map by like making you move box by box um, through like this fake 3D landscape. And there's like wall textures on the side of these boxes. So I have been um, milling on a CNC milling machine these wall textures from these games. So this is one of the wall textures from um, Eye of the Beholder that I use a simple script to change it to be. Um, um, to, to make to transform it into a 3D model, then I milled it on a CNC machine, which took 12 hours, and I still like think it could have been more detailed. Um, and then I carefully hand painted all of the original color pixel values onto the object. So this is made out of wood. Um, so the lights and darks are kind of made physical, with the lightest areas being at the highest and the darkest areas at the lowest. And um, I'm working on making entire rooms or hallways like this, and I don't know what's going to happen to my brain once this is in the world, but I think something really good is going to happen. And so I'm really good. Okay, so here it is again. <laughs> All right, but now um, back to interfaces. Well, I guess that was related to interfaces, but uh, uh, back to the main thread of my research. So when I was at RISD, I was using my, um, my artistic practice to like kind of reflect on this very intense relationship I had with computer interfaces and programming. And I'm sure you guys like don't know this, but many people don't, is that programming languages are actually a very technical kind of interface to talk to computers. Um, and so like many programmers, like, um, you, you know, I talk about like, ooh, I'm in, I'm in the zone, and you know? Like it's like that ecstatic flow state where like the code is just like coming out of your fingertips and it's like this empowered feeling where you're, you're so fluent in, in the programming language that you can just express your intentions as code without having to translate them. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Yes. Uh, I thought you guys might. Um, so uh, this is kind of what this piece is about. And um, what I noticed is actually user experience designers strive for this in their designs. Uh, the goal for the user is to be conscious about only what they are trying to do and to forget that the interface exists. Um, so this piece, which is called Singing Code, is an exploration of that phenomenon. Uh, so I sang all of my C++ code from one of my computer programs. <laughs> and uh, for those of you who don't code in C++, you always write two files. There's a header file, which has the definitions, a body file, which contains the instructions. And so the video on the top is me singing the header file. The video on the bottom is me singing the body file. And then there's another C++ program that's like looping the video so that it's always like a different combination. So we'll listen to this for just a minute. The secret to being funny is being really, really earnest. <laughs> <laughs> 
had the Mac screen reader read it aloud. And um, the result is like, so kind of like a sad, dark, yet funny poem. Um, and you can see that the words it picked are quite, quite uncanny, actually. In the event, will will him, 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 and him, and him, and him, and him, and him, and him, will will will, will 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 will, him, and him, and him, and him, and him, system, will you who are of will and will and will be. In the end, and it will go a little. I will. Yeah, so low point for me. <laughs> Very low. Um, but you know, when this happened, like I could see really how broken my relationship with computers really was. Like I had adapted myself considerably to be able to work with computers, um, and all these intense emotions I was feeling about the whole process, my joy and the feelings of empowerment and my frustration and the sadness. It was like painfully obvious to me at the time how one-sided and unhealthy it all was. Like I was being really manipulated by technology, and like it was shaping how I think. Um, so there's this double-edged sword. Uh, you feel that to get the joy and the empowered feelings, you have to allow yourself to be extremely shaped by the interfaces you're using. Um, and so like what happened is like it was like up until that point I was looking through clear glass and I just didn't see it uh, in a window, and then all of a sudden the glass became really dirty, and all of a sudden that was the only thing I could see. And so that's why I really started to think much harder about. Interface design and technology and what that meant. Um, and then a little, little side note, uh, Michelle Foucault describes the concept of governmentality as the techniques that a government uses to produce citizens most suited to its policies. And this, uh, when I was reading this, this struck me very similar to the goals of user experience design, which some people define as the design of behavior, which I think is a very creepy definition, the design of behavior. Um, and so I thought this was really scary, especially as I remember a lot of the people I met in Silicon Valley were making such important decisions about um, the technologies that are pervading parade everywhere. And I really started to think about how we can start designing interfaces in a more uh, positive and ethical way. And so that led me to my research at MIT. Um, so realizing how much I had been shaped by technology, and you know, as new technologies became even more, uh, even more so we're mediating our interactions with other people, I really started to wonder how computers were shaping our relationships, which I think a lot of people uh, in this room really care about too. Um, so at the MIT Media Lab, I attempted to investigate these questions. Um, I was researching social networks, social connection, and this led me to actually start research researching loneliness in general, which is not a very popular topic. Um, but you know, as I was researching loneliness, I realized it's a significant component of so many of the difficult problems our society faces today. Um, people don't talk about it, but it's pervasive and its consequences are significant. Um, social neuroscientist John Cacioppo began his research of loneliness when trying to understand the underlying causes of violence. Unsurprisingly, loneliness is a indicate is will. Um, make violence more likely. And he estimates 20% of people, this is 60 million people in the US alone, feel sufficiently isolated for it to be a major source of unhappiness in their lives. And some people, some research says that half the population is lacking in adequate counseling support. Um, so that means having one person who can confide in on personal matters. So that's like half the population. Some research says half do not. Um, and more than, more than ever, people now live alone, especially elderly people. Um, so unsurprisingly, like research shows loneliness, Harms productivity, concentration, and happiness, but uh, the, what the surprising thing is there's a lot of physical consequences to it as, as well. And Kachioko states that the side effects of loneliness are comparable to those of high blood pressure, lack of exercise, smoking, obesity, and more. And so there's actually a lot of research that um, I won't go into now that talks about the physical side effects of loneliness. But I think his most surprising result and his most interesting result for us is that it is not it's, it's the perceived sense of loneliness that's the culprit behind all this. It's not actually being physically alone. So the studies showed that the negative side effects were being caused by um, how you felt about yourself in your mind, not necessarily how many people you talked to, or whether you have someone to take you to the doctor, or you know things like, like these practical things. It's actually the subjective experience of loneliness that it is, is itself the problem. It's how a person feels in their mind. Um, and research, um, and there's like so many, so many problems, like research shows that lonely people are more likely to misread others, they get less of a uh, reward in the pleasures of their brain when they're actually interacting with people, and so this makes it even harder for someone who's already kind of trapped in this state of loneliness to get out of it. So we have social networks, we have connected technologies, why aren't they addressing this? Um, and how could they actually address this? Um, so actually at U of M, um, Ethan Cross has been showing that uh, Facebook makes people less happy, in particular, browsing Facebook passively, which is, I, I argue, something that it encourages by design, um, undermines
client's emotional well-being. So um, knowing these things, like why aren't we doing these kind of studies before we launch something? Um, so like what should we be building? Like, um, you know, upcoming technologies that are, you know, things that are being made now are even more intrusive than what already exists. Wearable technology is super intrusive. The Internet of Things term I can't stand, but I'll just use it for now. Uh, smart, you know, smart environments, smart homes, it's going to be, it's very pervasive, very intrusive. So it's more important than ever we actually start to consider these side, these like negative side effects, psychological side effects before we make it. And it's hard to change. Um, so what should we be building? So we're architecting these social experiences, engineering interactions between people. Are we going to choose like this broadcaster or subscriber model that Facebook, Twitter, and I would say most social media today are employing? Or are we going to simulate social connection for people who can't get it? Um, what does that mean if in our society, like the burden of caring is shifted from people to machines? Or are we going to use technology to create deliberate, constrained interactions between people? Like we have an opportunity here to make social connection easier, uh, to build something that's more like a social prosthesis, uh, like training wheels to help people get out of isolation. Uh, we can design interactions to meaningfully shift power dynamics between multiple parties. So like, can we make training wheels instead of crutches? Um, and maybe with the development of wearables and smart environments, we can even create more ambient feelings of connectedness that are like, I, I, I always think about dolphins, you know, like they, they can know where all their dolphin friends are just using like the vibrations. That would be so interesting. What if humans could do that? Amazing. Anyway, so when I started to build something, I was extremely, again, the sci-fi is coming out. I was really inspired by Do Android Dream of Electric Sheep by Philip K. Dick, which is one of my favorite books. Um, so this is the movie, the book that uh, Blade Runner is based on, but all the most interesting technologies from this book did not make it into the movie because they're all very mental technologies and they don't really fit on film. Um, and so the devices I built have that same quality where they really aren't very visual, they're much more something that you feel in your mind and haptically, um, so uh, they're, they can be a little bit hard to explain, but bear with me while I try. Uh, so anyways, in Philip K. Dick's world in this book, the majority of people on Earth are moved to colonies and there's very few people left on Earth. Um, you almost hardly ever see anybody. And they're extremely isolated and they have these devices called empathy boxes to cope with that isolation. And the way they work is when you grab the handles of your empathy box, um, you're immediately connected with all the other people who are holding their empathy boxes um, in a haptic and emotional way. Uh, so he wrote, um, an empathy box is the most personal possession that you have. It's an extension of your body. It's the way you touch other humans. It's the way you stop being alone. And what I really liked about his idea of what a connected technology could be was that it wasn't something that was trying to replace interactions in the real world. It was trying to use technology to do something that wouldn't be possible otherwise. So his device was connecting the user with thousands of anonymous people at the same time in a haptic and emotional way. So I designed an empathy box that connects many anonymous people through the shared experience of physical warmth. Um, and this is this is not a render, this is the actual thing. Everybody thinks it looks like a SolidWorks render. I didn't make it in SolidWorks though. Um, so I also built a wearable version. Um, it's called the Empathy Amulet that works asynchronously. Uh, so the previous one was synchronous, a synchronous experience. You have these at the same time. This one is an asynchronous experience um, and is more unconscious. Um, they also use a shared warmth. Um, and so these are a little hard to explain. So I have attempted to explain them with this fancy animation that I've done, which I will narrate. So um, the empathy box um, has handles that are made of bronze with heaters inside. And when multiple people um, are holding the handles of their empathy boxes at the same time, the handles are pulsing with warmth um, and kind of at the speed of a pulse or slow, uh, slow breathing. Um, I wanted the devices to look a little bit sci-fi, but in a timeless way. So I used metal and wood along with the electronics. Um, and I really see these not just sitting in a gallery, but I want them to be in people's personal homes and also public spaces like maybe the lobby of London Counseling Center. Um, the front of the empathy box is made from a reflective surface because I wanted the user to see a reflection of their chest overlaid with the LEDs that represent their connection with others. So when one person grabs the handles of the empathy box, the blue lights on the front go on. Um, which signal that it's on. And then simultaneously, all the other empathy boxes will begin to pulse with a soft white light at about the rate of slow breathing. Um, this is kind of like a call to action for other people. Um, when one or more people join in by grabbing the handles of their devices, all the handles of the empathy boxes pulse with warmth together.
So that Empathy Amulet is similar. It's also made from bronze and wood. Um, it has a heater on the back of it, um, so you feel the pulse of warmth against your chest. And like grabbing the handles of the Empathy Boxes, um, in order to activate the amulet, you, the wearer holds the ends of the amulet for a few moments of stillness and reflection, um, and you're supposed to reflect on the fact that you're connected to many anonymous people. Um, the five LEDs on the top of the device light up one by one to mark the passage of time. So after a few minutes, um, the amulet will pulse with warmth, and then the warmth is shared simultaneously with one other person in the network through their amulet. And because warmth is not a disruptive signal like sound or vibration, the receiver can choose to continue what they were doing or uh, can stop and reciprocate by sending a signal back out. And even if the receiver doesn't reciprocate immediately, um, it's a, this non-intrusive ambient feeling of warmth may encourage him to do this same thing later. Um, so what I wanted these amulets to be like was uh, like ripples in water, where one person taking the time to reflect makes it more likely that another person will do so, and then another. Um, so both devices incorporate reciprocity, such that comforting or help helping oneself means that you're actually helping someone else at the same time. And both of the devices take time to activate and are deliberately slower experiences that encourage reflection and focused attention. And both of these devices take advantage of how warmth is associated with human connection. But they do it in an abstract way without um, attempting to simulate face-to-face -face interaction. Um, these are not meant to replace people's interactions with others in real life, but to, inf to like, increase this subjective feeling of connectedness um, in a way that is only possible through a technology. And so when I was designing these devices, I was doing a lot of research of George Lakoff's theory of, of the embodied mind, uh, where he says that we understand our subjective experiences through physical uh, and abstract concepts through physical me metaphors. Um, and this is because the parts of the brain where the, our sensory motor experiences are um, processed and are inextricably, inextricably linked with the parts of the brain um, for subjective experiences as we grow up. So like a common example is that we conflate affection with physical, the physical experience of warmth because when we were babies, affection meant being held in warmth. And uh, the reverse actually is true also. Uh, so we, we use me physical metaphors to understand subjective experiences, but physical experiences can influence our subjective experiences as well. So 99% of our thought is unconscious, which is scary, and much of it is influenced by what we experience through our bodies. And numerous studies show that holding a warm object actually increases feelings of trust and social connection, which is why I leverage this in my design. However, it was important to me to not fake it and actually have another person behind, behind it. Um, there's lots of other examples of the, of the metaphors and the subjective experiences being very intertwined, especially with uh, spatial orientation and, um, because we have bodies and gravity, um, if you're interested in reading about it. But this is why I believe physical interfaces in particular have the potential to be very powerful for designing technologies for mental health. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy is shown to be an effective treatment for many mental issues. And it, what it involves is systematically identifying unhealthy thought processes and replacing them with healthy ones. And if we know that interfaces, in particular tangible ones, um, can structure thought patterns and re in reinforce or undermine our subjective experiences, how can we actually harness these kind of interfaces um, in a way like cognitive behavioral therapy to improve mental health. Um, so pharmaceutical drugs and self-help are both multi-billion dollar industries, and I think technologies like the Empathy Box and the Amulet have the potential to be therapeutic for people with PTSD, anxiety, depression, and social isolation, the elderly, of course, um, and, many, and also beneficial to people under normal conditions as well. So I've been doing research with uh, various medical companies, but I'm under NDA, can't talk about it, but it is something that people are thinking about now. Okay, now my favorite, science fiction. Why am I obsessed with science fiction? Um, so you can see it influences my own research, uh, but I also, it, I, I, uh, it go, my research is like very intertwined with my teaching. Um, for the last few years, I've designed and taught multiple versions of a sci-fi course with students from all disciplines, uh, from MIT, Harvard, Brown University. Uh, one was for designers and artists, one was more for engineers and designers uh, who are building physical prototypes. Another one was more on wearable technology, transhumanism, and cyborgs. And uh, in doing all this, I was surprised how many people who work with technology have not read all the most important sci-fi books that are related to it, which I think is um, sad. <laughs> uh, because very often those authors have been thinking about those technologies for decades before like the technology even was viable, so I think it's important to think about their ideas. And not only does sci-fi inspire great ideas for new technologies, it also, I think sci-fi is like an ethics class for an inventor. It's inventors, it's ethics class for inventors. So Frederick Cole said that a good science fiction story should be able to predict not the automobile, but the traffic jam. And I definitely think that is true. Um, I think designers and inventors need to be able to think more like sci-fi writers uh, during the early stages of creating a new technology. 
What happens when the thing you're making right now is used by millions of people? What, uh, what happens when the thing you're making now is now used by everybody a hundred times a day? Um, I think it is really crucial to think about what you're building in this like extrapolated long-term way early on, because like once a technology has any sort of adoption, you will not make big changes anymore. Like it's, you're kind of stuck with it, and maybe all you're going to be able to do now is just tack on features in a superficial way. So you really need to think about like underlying architecture early. Um, I also really like teaching sci-fi because um, it's a good way to make people from different disciplines work together. Like, normally, artists and you know engineers kind of make each other crazy. Um, but what is what uh, when engineers and scientists are like in the sci-fi context, they tend to be more whimsical, and artists uh, artists are able to uh, understand the technology in this more approachable and narrative way from the sci-fi. So um, I also have students who are like fluid dynamicists and like jewelers working together, and it seems to work really well. Uh, both my courses and the students' projects have received international recognition on NPR, Scientific American, Wired, Atlantic, Fast Company, and all these places. And probably the thing I was most happy to see about is how many of the student projects became parts of the students' main threads of research. So I'll just show you a few of those uh, projects, and then I'll wrap up. Can you see this? Okay, so this is uh, Sensory Fiction, which was a project uh, three of my students did that was inspired by Diamond Age by Neil Stevenson, which had an interactive book. Uh, that grows, uh, that evolves with you as you grow up. And then also this book, uh, this story, the short story, The Girl Was Plugged In by James Tiptree Jr., who's actually a woman who wrote with the male student. Um, and that was a sad story about this girl who um, had this like haptic interface to be experienced the sensations of, uh, she was like an ugly girl who hated herself, and she could like remotely experience this, the, all the experiences of this beautiful girl. And so she became, like it was a very sad story, it, ended, it like ended up with her destruction, but, um, they combine this, these two stories to make this uh, this wearable book. So as you flip the pages of the book, you experience uh, all the physical sensations in this wearable vest on your body. So uh, the book knows where you are, and you might feel cold or pressure or, um, I don't let's see what else they do, cold, pressure, vibration, different things. And it's interesting to think about what this would mean as a creative medium because not, you're not maybe, what if you're not just um, like matching the physical experiences in the book with like what you're, um, with the, what you're feeling in your body, but what if you're like writing poetry and you start to feel contradictory physical experiences to what you're reading? Like how would that completely change the medium? So there's a lot of interesting questions that came out of this one. One of my students was very interested in machine learning and, uh, and uh, a law, and he actually wrote uh, an actual software application that um, incorporated machine learning to automate the discovery process, and he used it on um, all the NRAC emails, which are publicly available on the internet. And the thing that was very interesting is he took all the results from this uh, software and he actually incorporated them into a comic, which like kind of told the whole story around the implications of what it would mean to automate um, the legal system. Um, this was a student who was experimenting with being able to download muscle memory into a robot and then re-upload it so that you could uh, teach someone, um, like Potter, even like a master Potter could teach um, that kind of muscle memory to an amateur Potter. Um, why is that play again? Uh, this was a really interesting project, um, and I think it has a lot to do with social con uh, social networks. So, um, one of my st one set of students in my transhumanism class, they built, they took an EEG cap and they tied it. They made this brain that they cast. Um, it was a realistic casting of a brain, so it was like squishy and it was like the size of a human brain and the weight of a human brain. And they put all these lights in there, and so it, those lights were turning on and off based on the readings from this EEG cap. And like you would think that's like kind of stupid. But actually, it was very interesting. And one of the things that it was like, it created a very unsettled, unsettling feeling as you were holding this brain um, and you were looking at it. Like, first of all, that was really weird. Uh, just looking at this thing lighting up while you're wearing this cap. But the really interesting part was like when someone else was holding the brain uh, and someone else was wearing the cap. Um, so that actually almost felt uncomfortable. Like, it was like, felt like too intimate of an interaction and like you were like invading their privacy even though obviously only lights are going on and nothing, you're not actually like reading their mind. But it was really disturbing. And so like that, like building projects like this, I think actually like raises a lot of interesting questions and makes you think a lot about it, a lot of different things. Um, some of my other students were um, exploring like, what it would mean to be able to share your heartbeat with other people, if that was just something like a channel you could let people have access to. And uh, what I liked about, so they built a physical prototype that worked, but I think what I really liked was that they actually built these like really high fidelity commercials for it, like that explored everything about what this would mean for dating, as well as what it would mean for going to the airport and dealing with the TSA. Like would, they, would you have to like give them control of your like heartbeat information as you like go through the 
the scanner. It was very, it was very interesting. <laughs> Uh, so what am I work? Uh, I guess uh, what am I doing here? Uh, so I'm in stamps. I said that uh, I teach creative programming here. I also teach the digital fabrication course, so like CNC milling, 3D printing, laser cutting, all that stuff. Um, I'm also working within the new Masters of Design program in our department, which is currently focusing on health technologies. Um, I am very interested in working on anything science fiction related with any students or faculty on any ever always. Um, and I hope that I'll be teaching the sci-fi class next year. Um, I'm also uh, very interested in continuing to build these kind of uh, technologies that focus on mental health. Again, I don't want to just put them on a podium in a gallery, even though that's one way to share your work. I'm really interested in being able to give them to people, let them live with it for a month, and then actually do these kind of meaningful user studies to see if any of these, uh, see if, it, if my, these ideas actually do have therapeutic benefits. And one thing I'm very interested in is to develop a set of UX design principles that are just not about just usability and utility, but um, which incorporate both psychology and ethics uh, for designers and industry. So what is ethical? What is like psychologically healthy? Um, it's not just about like efficiency of use. Um, and then I also have a, like, a long held dream of building my own robotic bowerbird. So I think I'm gonna work on that too. <laughs> <laughs> if, if anybody is really interested in bowerbirds, you should contact me. So I'm gonna end on, um, I want to end on one last point. Um, so it is very important to me to encourage what I call a crit an attitude of uh, critical optimism, um, which I think is desperately missing from both the tech world and the art world. Um, and in the tech world, there's this like, kind of attitude of blind optimism about technology, which I think is harmful. Uh, so like people are just like, yay, technology, let's do more. Uh, and then it's like people running with scissors off of a cliff like with like, like weddings. And then there's like this opposite extreme where people who think technology is evil, adding technology to anything is a taint. Uh, and they want to either avoid it, which is completely unrealistic, or they're making work that is just critical or ironic about it, and I also don't think that's very productive. Uh, so what I really try to encourage is like a hopeful and optimistic attitude, but not without like the healthy dose of criticality that you need to make ethical choices when you're designing these technologies. Because uh, like as I've shown, uh, technology has like an incredibly uh, strong power over people. And so I want to end with, my, with another sci-fi quote from my favorite sci-fi author, uh, Ursula K. Le Guin, which I think summarizes really well uh, my goals as an artist, um, designer, uh, and teacher. Um, so we need leaders who can see alternatives to how we live now, can see through our fear-stricken society and its obsessive technologies to other ways of being, and even imagine real grounds for hope. Um, and so I think that sums everything up pretty well. Um, and there's other work I didn't have time to share, which is on my website, you can check out later. Um, Thank you very much for having me. I am very happy to answer any questions you might have. Yes? Um, I guess, what are the different social conditions that you're most interested in in technology? Um, I'm I, I think st uh, st the, st the kind of stress-related ones, like in PTSD, are very are the mo I, I think a serious problem. Uh, I'm not talking about like mild anxiety. I'm talking about like severe anxiety of like uh, people who've gone through trauma. I think that's very interesting. Uh, I've done uh, I've been doing work with schizophrenia, which is a very hard one. Um, depression is also interesting. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy is shown to be beneficial for all like almost every issue. So I think that this approach could also be beneficial for almost all of them. Yes? So a teaching related question. Um, you mentioned your class on science fiction mm -hmm. and how it may have reshaped it based on the different disciplines of students that you teach. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that? What, like what changed um, based so on who you were? Yeah, I can. Um, so I actually change it. Uh, I get a sense of who's in my class and all their research interests. And luckily, I've read so much sci-fi that I can curate the readings to the students. Mm -hmm. uh, so if I know I have a student who's like really interested in um, design and fabrication machines, I can find the appropriate stories for them to read. Um, so I always decide. I, there's always a few things that I think everybody should read. Uh, but I can. Uh, there's such a huge pool of short stories that most people haven't read that I can tailor uh, to almost any any theme, like medical or. Uh, I guess mental mental health, uh, environment, augmented reality. I have like a huge, I have a categorized list. Could you share that? Yeah, I could. <laughs> it's not very it's very messy. <laughs> yes. I have a question. 
question about translation. So a lot of your work strikes me as being committed to um, creating artifacts that in part facilitate translation. And you yourself as a cyborg, you know, mm -hmm. are a kind of translational object in that sense as well, like object. Um, so I'm curious, you know, I mean, you told your story, which is so fascinating, right, from the age of two, you know, it's on the one hand, a very personal story of how that, how you started at a very young age, interfacing and living technology, actually, right? Mm -hmm. So what do you think that translation work looks like for somebody who had a very different access to technology and how, what role can play design in enabling other people to become translators mm -hmm. of alternatives? I don't know. I, one thing that's tricky is that I grew up with computers before the internet, and now everybody's growing up with the internet. I can't even imagine what the, I, 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 it's hard for me to even empathize what that means with the people who are kids who have just grown up with the internet as a normal. Um, I don't even, I, I would like to be the person who translates that, but I don't, I, I, I don't know if I could even empathize. I do, I don't know, I do have, I guess I'm just, I'm just kind of free associating now. Uh, but like this meaningful mapping thing is a big deal to me because like as a programmer, like you can map anything to anything and make something look cool. But like trying to actually choose, very make very deliberate choices of what you're, what you're using as your input, what your output is, and like uh, following through with it, uh, like being committed to your system. I think there's a lot of value in that as a way to understand something. I don't know if that answered your question. But yeah, it's 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 hard to like uh, not want to edit the results um, and just do things that look cool, but self control. <laughs> yes, what's the bird that you referenced? Um, it's a bird that uh, where the male birds uh, collect pretty things and put them in piles. And the thing that's fascinating about them is they all make their different aesthetic choices. So some of them pick orange flowers, some of them pick blue plastic, some of them pick white rocks, black rocks. And like I really I really want to understand like why are, how are they choosing these things? And arranging them, they they have like all have a different arrangement system. It would be very interesting to make it into a robot. No, <laughs> 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 it's I think so. <laughs> it's gonna happen. Yes. Um. So part of what I'm seeing in your you know, the technology that you're designing around loneliness, it's not necessarily. It's more about changing what loneliness means to people, not necessarily avoiding loneliness. Um, so, have you been able to do any kind of like historical research into like what loneliness has looked like uh, throughout history, and like how it's it's particularly playing, how, how like uh, implementation of technology is potentially changing what loneliness means? I have read about it a little bit um, because I was re I did read a lot about loneliness, and it is different now because people actually used to live in neighborhoods, um, so you actually know your neighbors. That doesn't happen anymore. Um, the internet is actually kind of making people isolated. Um, being attached to a device actually makes you ignore the people around you. Um, I don't know if the idea of loneliness has changed. I know that what causes people to be lonely is different, uh, but I think that uh, there's a big difference between being alone and enjoy and being in solitude than being lonely. I think loneliness is when the uh, is when it becomes uh, a negative experience. And like the research, uh, there's many studies that show that it's actually it really isn't about how many people you talk to per week. It's like they, they, they were able to like isolate that out, or like whether someone's driving to the doctor. It really is about your perception. So um, I, I, guess, I think that's the most interesting point to remember. And of course, that sort of perception actually will change as uh, as our society has a different structure. So we have a, it's uh, in that sense, lonely, the idea of loneliness does does evolve. Yes. Uh, we saw a lot of uh, research on um, technology and emotion. Uh, so how does it scale on uh, varying the demographics of the people using the products? Like, uh, say uh, the uh, that uh, that particular uh, box was uh, used by two different people on different side parts of the world. So would it still be the same experience for both of them? I don't know. I would have to try it. That's why I want to actually do studies, and not just like in a, in a, like I also I also really don't want to just do them in a artificial environment. I really want to put it in people's natural homes. I'm, I'm curious about like, I when I, did, when I did my like few user studies I had time to do, they weren't, I would like to do much more, but I was just very interested in letting people take these home and see where they put it in their house and like where, and how they like, what stories they told them to themselves in their mind about what it was and what everything meant. It's very interesting. It's really different um, seeing someone use a technology in their house than it is to see them use it in 
your your uh, user studies lab. Um, there are no more questions. I'm sure that we will stick around for a couple more minutes, and people mm -hmm. can also come up and talk a little bit with her. Thank you so much again. Thank, Thank you. For